So now we're going to transition uh, away from uh, from weird infections for a bit and, and look at some other things. So this is just a really lovely picture of skeletal muscle, is it not? It's so cool because you can see the, the Z lines and the striations. You can see, I think, artifactually the tissue kind of pulled apart a little here and like emphasized the lines uh, and the uh, structure of the, the contractile filaments in the muscle. And you can also see, for some strange reason, the, uh, the uh, peripheral nuclei of the skeletal muscle fiber got lined up in this funny zigzag pattern. I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's just a funny artifactual cut, but I thought it was really cool. I'm, I'm easily amused and interested in interesting patterns under the microscope. I think that's what happens if you do pathology for too long. You start, you get pareidolia where you see, you know, people see shapes in the cloud. I see shapes in the, in the microscope slides. If it's happened to you, it might be too late to turn back from a career in pathology, but that's okay. I'm fine with it. So, uh, but I also just am, am mesmerized by the patterns that we see under the microscope. So in any case, I wanted to share that with you because I thought it was fun. Uh, and there's a closer view. So cool uh, that in the body where everything is so, you know, curved and rounded and not geometric, we get skeletal muscle where you get like perfectly straight lines. Um, and that's not, you know, a common thing to see in, a, in an organic structure, you know. So there is a reason here, not just to show you the, the pretty stuff. There's a practical thing that I'm showing here. So this is also skeletal muscle. And so, you know, we don't see the striations here. Now, if you're if you're a beginner watching this or, or if there's anyone in your audience who's who's maybe a new first year, how do we know it's skeletal muscle? Because you can't just say, you know, what tissue is this? It's muscle. You got to say what kind of muscle, right? Skeletal, smooth, cardiac. Those muscle types are in different parts of the body and it can tell us a lot about where exactly the biopsy or specimen is coming from, especially if we're not giving great information um, from, you know, from the person submitting the, the uh, sample. So that's always a good thing. Knowing your basic histology is really important. And so seeing striations tells us, great, skeletal muscle. But remember, cardiac muscle also has striations. But here I can't, I can't see good striations from this power. Um, but how do I know it's skeletal muscle? Well, that's because there's peripheral nuclei, right? The nuclei, I know this is an exception here, but the nuclei are multiple and they line up around the outside of each individual skeletal muscle fiber. Also, the color of skeletal muscle is like kind of a deeper reddish pink uh, than smooth muscle, which is like a pale pink. But I think that the shades of pink is quite nuanced and it takes some time to, to get good at that. So the, the reason I'm showing this is what are these dark cells right here? I will show you some more pictures and you can tell me what is happening here. What, what are these? Because this is a really important thing to know about. Now look closer, we can see the striations, right? Now you believe me. What are these? Yes, very good. Dark hyperchromatic cells. When they're multi multinucleated like this and you can see some striations, it's easy to tell, oh, this is skeletal muscle that's shrinking and atrophying. And when it atrophies, all of those many nuclei that it has in each fiber, all the nuclei along the outside, as the muscle cell, you know, consumes its own proteins and breaks itself down and shrinks down to conserve energy, the nuclei come closer and closer and closer together and eventually they overlap completely. And when you can see it happening, no problem. But when you get one like that, that can look a lot like a big hyperchromatic pleomorphic nuclei, especially from low power. And if you see that and in the setting of a tumor, like sometimes tumors like desmoid fibromatosis, for example, infiltrates muscle, traps the muscle, makes muscle atrophy, and you can see scattered pleomorphism there and then think it's a sarcoma or something like that. So you may say, well, this is easy, but I've definitely seen times where it can be quite tricky. And, and I feel like this is something that sometimes people in pathology as they're learning struggle with. So recognizing skeletal muscle atrophy in all the different flavors and forms is really important uh, because it can trip you up and cause you to make a mistake if you're not familiar with it. So uh, I like to always point it out. So one thing that's very helpful about muscle atrophy is it's usually not by itself. You usually don't get one single skeletal muscle atrophy cell because muscle runs in bundles. The fibers are all clustered together in a skeletal muscle bundle, like we see here, multiple individual fibers all clumped together. So when the muscle atrophies, even if it's not the whole muscle bundle, just part of it, you tend to see a little cluster of cells that are atrophied and in varying levels of atrophy together. Some which are totally crunched down and look like a smudgy dark nucleus. It's really multinucleated, but we just can't see it. And then others where they still have some retained cytoplasmic um, uh, uh, contractile filaments. 
And it's important also to recognize this because guess what? These are going to stay in with Desmond. So if you think it's a tumor cell and you do Desmond and it's positive and then you might think, oh, this is a rhabdomyoblast. Maybe we have a rhabdomyosarcoma. I've certainly had times where I struggled because of entrapped skeletal muscle atrophy. I struggled to tell. I knew I had a sarcoma, but I couldn't decide is the sarcoma making rhabdomyoblasts or are these just entrapped muscle atrophy? Because sometimes I've seen rhabdomyosarcomas that have entrapped muscle and had muscle atrophy. So the question became, is this really muscle atrophy only, or is there also rhabdomyoblastic differentiation? We have both, and, and uh, it's been tricky. I've definitely had times where I've struggled with that uh, previously. So recognizing it when it's real obvious is the first step, and then you can learn the more nuanced way of, of dealing with it when you're in the tumor setting. So I love the, this, how they're clustered together, and usually if you find it and you have a big enough sample, you can kind of track back from the cells where you're like, oh, I think it could be muscle atrophy, I'm not sure, and you look around and you'll start finding other cells near it that are more obvious, and then you'll find some striations, and then you'll say, oh, look, I can see it's connected up to this other muscle group. Okay, it's all muscle atrophy. Now, the, the flip side is that sometimes atrophic muscle looks different than what I just showed you. And it looks, instead of, uh, instead of the cells getting really small and dark and crunched on top of each other, uh, the, the muscle cells do get smaller and the nuclei come together, but the nuclei, instead of getting small and dark, they get big and have open chromatin and big nucleoli. So you can tell here there's some scar, I can't remember the, the setting here, some fibrosis. Here's a not normal muscle, but no, more normal muscle. And that you can see... It, at the interface here between the, the scar and the muscle, there's entrapped, damaged, unhappy muscle fibers. I don't know if they're really unhappy, but I like to think of cells as like little people and to ascribe emotions uh, and feelings to them. Again, that happens if you do pathology for too long, but it's okay. I'm fine with it. So I don't know exactly why this happens, but my theory is that these are muscle cells that haven't like given up the fight and they're activating and turning on gene expression to try to either like rebuild themselves or regenerate in some capacity and that that's why their nuclei expand and they get big nucleoli but if you look around enough you will eventually especially in the setting where there's a lot i feel like i see this more in like robust granulation tissue uh tumor bed re-excision they had a surgery two weeks ago and now they're going back and taking more i feel like i see this type of muscle change more in that really acute revved up setting of reactive muscle change i don't know if that's true but i just uh it seems like that's that's the case. I've never sat down and actually counted the cases, but but I think it's important because these nuclei look kind of atypical, right? They don't look like normal skeletal muscle nuclei. They look big. They have uh, they're much larger than normal skeletal muscle nuclei. They have central kind of prominent nuclei. The muscle cell gets this kind of amphiphilic color to it. Again, if you look around enough, you can usually find some striations. You can also see that the weird cells track back and they become more and more and more obviously you know, here you might say, I don't know what that is. And then you're like, well, that looks like, mu oh, it's definitely muscle. See what I'm saying? As you track back, you can eventually find like the, the obvious muscle, which makes it more easy to answer the question. So just be aware that this is a kind of a different flavor of skeletal muscle atrophy. And it's one that I think is important because it looks kind of, you know, kind of funky and atypical. And if you just got one of these, especially like on a cytology specimen, you know, you might be tempted to think that this was an atypical or malignant cell, a multinucleated tumor cell, something like that. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of learning all the weird reactive stuff because uh, it, it's, it doesn't seem very exciting. It's not something that, you know, people usually write chapters and books about, uh, but it's something that's really important in practice because if you're not familiar with it, it can definitely trick you and you can make a big mistake. And uh, the time to start learning reactive changes whether it's granulation tissue or weird reactive epidermal hyperplasia mimicking squamous cell carcinoma or skeletal muscle atrophy, whatever it is, the time to start learning reactive changes is not when you're reading a frozen section and you're trying to decide is this tumor at the margin or not and they're going to go and take off part of somebody's nose or whatever. That's not the time to start studying. The time to start studying is when you have a boring excision specimen that you know is not a certain type of cancer or you know it's reactive because it's an abscess you know for sure clinically there's no tumor there that's the time to look at just how wild reactive stuff can look look at how weird the vessels and the myofibroblasts look in granulation tissue look at how many mitoses there are in granulation tissue look how weird the skeletal muscle atrophy looks or the the reactive osteoblasts at a site of you know a, a fracture repair where you know the fracture was from trauma because they had a 
an ATV accident two weeks ago and now ortho is doing a procedure. So the times to learn are when you're like 100% sure that it's benign, reactive, inflammatory setting, not neoplastic. Study those cases and then it will help you to build that skill. It's something even 12 years into practice, even as a soft tissue pathologist, I still, and, and a dermatopathologist, I still struggle sometimes with reactive changes in the skin and in the soft tissue. Even though I, I have a particular interest in this, I teach about it, I look at it, I still struggle with it. So you can never see enough reactive stuff. So there's, there's my, my lecture for you today. It doesn't seem exciting. It may not be something that I don't know if it'll get asked on your, you know, board exam. I have no idea what gets, what will get asked on your board exam. But the point is, is it may not seem something that's high yield, but in real life practice, very high yield. And the more comfortable you are with it, uh, the better you are uh, going to be enabled to, to avoid pitfalls. All right. And then that's back to the start. Uh, oh, and then this is just a little, a bit, a little, a little bit of path art for you here. Look at that. Is that not gorgeous? This makes me think of like soap bubbles or something. The way it's like green and then pink, like have a, like a, like a shadow or something. I don't know. Again, maybe I've been doing this too long. This is skeletal muscle and it's not as dramatic, but you can see there's atrophy here because look at the fibers. They're smaller, right? These fibers are big and look at how tiny. And again, the, the atrophy tends to cluster together. There's a little atrophy there. I can't remember that this, I think was next to it, maybe an abscess or something. And we did a, this is a PIS stain with a green counter stain which is quite lovely, isn't it? It's very pretty. Um, so there's no fungus here. It was, it was done for something else on a different part of the slide, on a big excision. And I was just like, whoa, I have never um, stained muscle with PAS. That's a green counter stain. And it just happened to have a really cool appearance. So I snapped uh, some photos and I just had to share them with you because if you don't like that, I can't make you happy. Come on, look at that. Isn't that amazing? You can hang that on your wall. All right, any questions? Oh, wait, there's one more picture, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's kind of nice, too, because here we get uh, instead of the cross section view that we had. Now we get a longitudinal section and you can see the striations and you can see how like irregular the outline of the muscle is. It's like just so crunched up and very, very unhappy, I think. Pretty cool, huh? All right. I know you probably never had someone talk to you for like, 20 minutes about skeletal muscle atrophy before, but now you have. And next time when you see it, you're going to be like, maybe years from now, but you're going to be like, whoa, yes, this could totally have tripped me up. You're going to remember this moment. And then you can send me an email and say, 25 years ago, you gave us a lecture at UPenn about skeletal muscle atrophy. And it'll make me feel like all of my, uh, my talking was not in vain. I hope that my kids do that one day too, with all the lectures that I give to them. I have three daughters. Um, the oldest one's 12. So uh yeah life is life is pretty exciting and fun and interesting and i do lecture them about a lot of stuff and they're like ugh dad but i like to think that one day they'll be like well well dad remember how you said that saving money is a good thing i've been saving and investing so that's that's my hope all right